there we have it. It's gonna be super fun. And then we got straps. Kinda like it. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. For those of you who are new around here and don't know who I am, my name is Madison. I'm a high school fashion design teacher by day and a seamstress and YouTuber by night and by weekend. So here on YouTube, I film sewing and style videos to share my love and passion for fashion with you all. And I'm so excited that you are stopping by to watch today's video. I'm very excited about it. I know I say that about every single video that I film, but I'm super excited about today's video. But honestly, today I'm very excited because we are doing something fashion history related and I am nerding out. So if you've been watching my videos for a while, you probably know that aside from just fashion and sewing and modern trends, I also absolutely adore fashion history. Um, last year, I wore historical costumes every single day for a week to teach my fashion history unit in my fashion design classes, and that was super fun. So you got to kind of see a sneak peek of some of the historical garments that I have, but I am currently have started to kind of like work through this whole long list of historical garments that I want to create and make and with being someone who loves to make historical clothing also comes my highly obsessed nature of loving to watch period dramas and historical shows and movies so you can only imagine that back in December when Bridgerton came out I was very intrigued by the whole idea a Regency kind of TV show um, and was also very intrigued by the styles of the show because that's a huge part of kind of the whole show in general just aside from the storyline and so today we're going to kind of be doing something that's a little bit inspired by that but also that's largely inspired by historical accuracy of Regency times in the early 1800s. So like I said today's video and project is slightly inspired by the show Bridgerton. Now if you haven't seen it um it's a good show. You can go watch it if you want. I will just say for a warning, there's like nine or 10 scenes that you have to skip. So I don't just say like everyone should go and watch it because I know that there are some things that I didn't like in the show. But aside from that, historical costuming wise, it was a super fun show. Even if all of the fashion historians had a lot of issues with the historical inaccuracies of the costumes. Um, Bridgerton did a really great job of creating costumes that helped to tell the storyline um, of each character and created costumes that really elevated and showed who each character was supposed to be within the story. But they didn't do that in very historical ways when it came to the colors, the fabrics, and sometimes the styles. And even in many times, the undergarments, which a lot of fashion historians had a lot of issues with, and I know noticed that as well. Because I feel like if you want to be historically accurate, undergarments are a really important thing to be historically accurate for. But if one thing came out of Bridgerton, it was the fact that everyone suddenly was obsessed with corsets. Now, corsets were a trend that we saw forecasted to come into fashion towards the end of last year and carry on all the way into 2021. So suddenly after watching that show, every single person was going out and buying corsets. I feel like every single person on TikTok, I was just like every other video was people buying corsets and styling them in different ways. But the issue that I had is that everyone was buying corsets that were very modern and that were also very much the styles and the silhouettes of the late 1800s and nothing compared to what corsets were supposed to be in the early 1800s and actually in the early 1800s regency time periods corsets didn't actually exist we had something called stays um, so there have been so many youtube videos created talking all about the fashions and the style of bridgerton so if you want to go watch those and learn more I will link them all down below. A lot of my favorite um, historical seamstresses and YouTubers created videos that I have watched. Um, so they're all really great. So I would encourage you to go watch that. Um, and I learned a lot about the historical inaccuracies of the show aside from the things that I already knew. So today's video, we're gonna be focusing on a much more historical, accurate, historically accurate representation of the corsets but they're not corsets because they're called stays. Now the difference between the late 1800s corsets is that corsets were created to kind of accentuate the waist, make it smaller. Corsets tended to have a lot more boning and really fit the body differently because they were created to give the body a different shape, more of an hourglass shape, whereas in early Regency time 
period stays um, did not really have as many boning channels and they were created to just smooth out the body and elevate the bust. They were not created to make your waist smaller and they also weren't created to be uncomfortable. Last year I made an 1830s version of stays for an 1830s dress that I was creating and the 1830s stays are very much in line with what the early 1800s stays were since the undergarments kind of stayed very accurate for the first 30 to 40 years of the early 1800s. So these are my 1830s stays. Um, they go all the way down to the hip. So this is a style that very much would have been worn during Regency time periods. And I love these. <laughs> They're very, very comfortable. Um, and so in today's video, we're going to be making a style that's very similar to these, except that it's going to be shorter. So rather than them going all the way down to the waist, it's going to fit right under the bust. And this is something that was very historically accurate for the 1800s, something that we saw in Bridgerton and we'll also see in many other types of historical shows and Regency time periods, um, such as Pride and Prejudice and the like. But I'm not just going to be making one set of stays. We are going to be making two set of stays. So we are going to be making a fairly historically accurate version for the early 1800s. And then when I say fairly historically accurate, I mean that we are going to be using a pattern that is based off of a historical style. We are going to be creating it to look historically accurate, but I am not using historically accurate techniques because that would require me to sew by hand and I just don't have the patience for that. So somewhat historically accurate um, in regards to the whole look of it is being accurate, but the construction, not so much. And then we are going to kind of change it up a little bit and we are going to create that exact same style, but for modern time period. So as we know, stays are an undergarment for historical fashion, which means they are worn underneath clothes. But the trend with stays or corsets, as many people call them and are wearing, is that they're worn as normal clothes on the outside of um, your clothing. And so we're going to be reimagining that historical silhouette into a modern style to be worn as like an outer accessory and it's going to be so much fun i got this idea from a tiktok video where i saw a girl use the exact same pattern that i'm going to be using and she made the exact same set of stays but she wore it on the outside of her clothing and it was so chic and so classic and so i thought it'd be fun to show you a historical representation of regency stays but also show you how you can take those historical silhouettes and reimagine them for modern times which is very much in trend for 2021 i'm so excited about this um so we are going to be using a pattern from red thread Red Thread is a company that creates historical stays and corsets, so they make stays from the 1700s, Regency stays, and then they also make corsets for the late 1800s. They create all of them and you can buy it straight from Red Thread, but they also create patterns for all of their stays so that historical sewers can make them for themselves. And so that is the pattern that we are going to be using for this. It's my first time using this pattern. I used a different historical pattern for this set of stays so we shall see how it compares um and we are going to be using like a white canvas tweed um weaved fabric that i bought off of etsy since tweed weave is something that's recommended for historical undergarments specifically stays and corsets and then we're going to be using a yellow satin for the modern version of these so i am very excited about this so we're going to take you into this process um for those of you who like historical fashion Hope you enjoy this. For those of you who are new to historical fashion, welcome. Historical fashion is so much fun and exciting and it helps us to better appreciate our modern clothes and how much fashion has changed and evolved over the years. So let's dive into designing and sewing. So this is the red thread pattern at Regency States 1800 to 1825. They give you instructions for how to make them. They also give pictures, which is super helpful and nice. And then we have all of our pattern pieces. So it's going to show you where you're going to make cuts, where you're going to sew. So these are all of the pieces we are going to be using to construct them. The first step in this project is to cut out all of my pattern pieces. I decided to start with my historical Regency stays first. And to cut out all of these pattern pieces, I'm going to need to make sure and cut all of them two times because these stays are actually lined, but they are lined with the same kind of fabric to give it more structure. I decided to use my rotary cutter and my cutting mat because honestly, that is my preferred method of cutting things out now. It's just way quick, quicker and it's a lot more accurate. So once all my pieces are cut out, I'm then going to start attaching all of the pieces together since there are a lot of small pieces that have to be connected in order to make the front, the back pieces and the straps.
Another important aspect of this project are all of the pattern markings which help with creating the gussets and adding in all of the boning later on in the project. I prefer to add all of my pattern markings especially for any historical stays or corsets before I sew all my pieces together because after they're sewn it's really hard to get accurate transfers of your markings. So I'm using some of my erasable pens and markers and I'll talk about them more later in the video. After all my pattern pieces are cut out, I am going to baste my gusset layers together and then I'm also going to start connecting all of the different pieces for my stays. Now if you're new to historical fashion or to historical sewing, you might be wondering what in the world are gussets? Now gussets are the little shapes of fabric in the bottom left hand corner of your screen and these are going to be inserted into sections that I cut out of the front of my stays to actually widen and open up the front bust piece of the set of stays to in a way kind of create a bust shape and this is one of the key features of Regency stays. While the rest of the pattern pieces for these stays just get connected together at side seams, the gussets actually have to be basted together so that there will be two layers once they're inserted into the front. And like always, anytime I'm done sewing a seam, I'm always going to press these open. This is also extra important when creating any type of corsetry or stays because usually your seams end up being channels for your boning and you're always going to make sure that they are pressed nice, flat, and open so that your corset or stay boning will be able to be inserted into the channels once you sew them. Now that all of our shoulder straps and front seams have been sewn together, we're going to connect the front of the stays to the back sections. And because the stays are going to be lined, we are going to do this two times so that we have two identical pieces, which will then be sewn together. Part of these stays are going to be finished with bias tape along the raw edges on the outside like the neckline and the bottom of the stays. However, for my straps, I decided to sew them right sides together along the edges and then I'm going to turn them right side out and press them. That way I have some finished aspects of my stays and also I'm still going to get the historical detail of the finished edges with the bias tape. Anytime you're working with curves, it's always a good idea to either clip or notch the curves before you flip your fabric and your seams right side out. That way all of your curves will lay and press nice and flat after they are turned right side out. And your garment will just have a much more professional look and the curves will really not give you any problems or issues. So this is what the straps and the back of the stays look like after they have been sewn right sides together and turned out. And then you can also see the raw edges that will eventually be covered in bias tape at the end. In order to make sure my layers of fabric don't shift on me as I start to sew the boning channels, I'm simply going to base together the top neckline and the bottom of the stays before I start sewing the channels.
Before I sew and insert all of the different boning channels, I have to first insert my gussets. Now this is probably the most complicated and frustrating part of creating stays from the early 1800s because you have to snip the fabric along the top section of the bust and then you have to insert these fabric pieces to widen the bust sections. But as you're doing this, you also have to turn down and press the raw edges of the fabric that you have snipped. So it's a very tedious process, you have to turn down the raw edges of the fabric fabric on the front layer and the back layer and then make sure that as you're sewing it right along the edge that every little piece kind of gets sewn down. So as you can see my edges have been folded in. I actually ironed them down off camera and then as I am pinning I'm making sure that all of those raw edges of fabric are getting kind of tucked into place. The hardest part is the very end of the triangle. Um, I actually used a little bit of fray check along those pieces to make sure that it wouldn't fray really bad. So this part probably took me a good 45 minutes and actually as you will see later in the video I actually ended up going in, ripping out all of my seams and making my gussets smaller because at first they didn't fit. Now that our gusset pieces have been inserted, it's time to sew them into place. Now sewing them into place, make sure and take your time and you also want to make sure to sew right along the edge of that fabric that's folded in. That way it catches on both layers and holds your gussets into place without any raw edges escaping. So we sewed all of the gussets in, so now we just have to see if it will fit. Moment of truth. I think we can make it work. So it's definitely like a little bit gappy at the top, but um, everything else seems to fit pretty well. So I think what I'm gonna do is when I sew the binding on, there's a lot of Regency corsets that actually kind of have a drawstring along the top, so you can adjust the tightness of it. Um, Cause obviously I could have kind of sewed the gussets a little bit more closed, um, but I feel like they are sewn kind of how they should be. So we're just going to kind of like adapt it as we go since we didn't sew mock-up beforehand because I hate sewing mock-ups even though I should be doing that to work out details before I actually sew it. So yesterday we got all the layers sewn together um, and then I basted them at the top and the bottom and left openings wherever I'm going to go and sew in all of the boning channels and then we also sewed in the gussets and the gussets are where you basically split pieces in the front and then you sew new pieces of fabric and this creates the kind of elevated fit of the bust of the stays, which I really like. It's kind of, in a way, like an old fashioned push up um, bra. Um, and this is why I really love stays because the gussets are just very comfortable. I did realize though um, that on this side I got a little ambitious with this left gusset and I actually cut it way deeper than it was supposed to be. So these are basically the same length ways down and these are how the pattern tells you where the left side is supposed to be shorter. Um, so yeah, there's that. And I also only sewed mine with one line of stitches. You can go in and sew more, but I think I'm just going to keep it as is. So I'm gonna go in real quick and I am going to kind of draw in where I want my seams to be for my boning. This is the boning I'm using. It's not very historically accurate. Um, I think this pattern tells you to actually use um, the metal or steel boning, but I personally prefer a more flexible plastic. I just got this in a huge roll off of Amazon and it's super easy to cut and make whatever shape that you want. So the pattern tells us that we're going to have boning on the sides of these seams. Um, really, you could kind of add boning wherever you want, or you could even just leave it without um, or put way less in, which I think I'm going to do on the modern one. So I'm just going to go draw some lines to make sure that I sew these casing sections to the right kind of widths. A lot of times I like to use these magic markers. Um, the purple side is air and water soluble, and the blue is water soluble, so these are my favorite marking techniques. But I also love to use the Pilot Friction Pins. So these are the pins that are actually erasable. So if you need a good erasable pin, there's that. But 
Um, you can also use them to mark on fabric. And the cool thing about them is that when you apply heat to it, they completely disappear. So you can make whatever markings you want. And then when you go in with your iron and apply heat to it, it disappears. So you don't have to use water or just wait for it to disappear with air. So this works really good um, for things that you know you're eventually going to press. Um, and it makes a really nice fine little line, which I personally really like. So we're just going to kind of go in and put in our markings for our seams for our boning. Now that I have markings for all of my boning channels, I'm just going to go and sew a lot of straight lines to actually create those channels for my boning to be inserted in the next step. Okay, so I went in and I made the gussets a little bit smaller and it definitely fits a whole lot better. I also went in and sewed all my boning channels and then in the back, um, this was supposed to be where the eyelets were, but since I had extra fabric, I just moved them over so I would have a little extra inch um, to go across my back since I kind of needed that and then I just folded in the edge and this is where I'll put the eyelets and then there will be boning on both sides of it. Same thing on this side, I just moved it over. Um, so now I ironed a crease into the center front so that I can sew a seam there and then seams on the side of it and I'm going to put boning in the front right here and then we'll put the eyelets in and then we'll leave all of the edging till the end to be hand sewn. When cutting all of my boning pieces for my stays, I simply just measure them based on the channels that they are going to be inserted into. And since I'm using a fiber and plastic based lightweight boning. I decided to use a striker to kind of melt the ends that way it doesn't snag any of my fabric as I'm inserting it and also it won't have sharp edges that are going to poke through my fabric. After I insert all of my boning, I always like to give it a press because the plastic boning will actually be able to conform with the heat um, to create the curves and shapes that you need them to be. So, just making the gusset smaller definitely helps a lot and also having the boning in the front because the front kind of curves out and then it comes in so it actually fits really well to your torso and your body and looks so much better oh my gosh so much better and then i extended the sides about an inch so they actually close a lot better in the back and then the rest will be closed by um your crisscross closure so now we just need to put the eyelids into the back and then the eyelids into the straps and into the front and then we need to put the bias tape along the raw edges so eyelets might seem a little bit intimidating at first, but after all of my many historical projects that I made last year, I am quite adept at inserting eyelets now. So I still use an awl to make my holes, and then I use a small piece of scissors to kind of cut and open up the hole a bit more before I insert my eyelet and then use an eyelet clamper to install them into place. They actually, though, make eyelet punches that I really want to get for my studio. I have one at school for my students, and it's so helpful rather than using an awl. Um, but the eyelets are super easy to insert. Just make sure you insert them at all of the markings that you have. So we're going to have eyelets for the straps to tie them into place with ribbon. And then we have eyelets along the back for the closure. 
So the last thing I have to make in order for these stays to be complete are my bias tape pieces to sew along the top neckline and the bottom of my stays to finish off the edges and encase them. So I simply cut one inch wide pieces of white cotton fabric and then I'm inserting it into my handy dandy bias tape maker. That way I can fold in and press down both edges so that it has a lot easier of an application. This tool is super cool and also tip, you don't actually have to buy your bias tape, you can make it every single time. So I'm simply going to pin down and sew one edge of the bias tape along the top neckline and the bottom of my stays. So I'm simply pinning down one of the edges that I had pressed in. And then after my bias tape is sewn into place, I'm going to fold it over my raw edges and hand sew it down along the inside to give it a nice finished edge. One thing I really love about historical stays from the early 1800s are how these straps are attached to the rest of the piece using ribbon. So I decided to just use this kind of polyester cotton blend ribbon that I got at Hobby Lobby. Um, that way all of my colors are matching, but you could go in with a pop of color, which is super fun. And the great thing about how these straps are connected is that you can actually adjust it for your fit if you need a higher fit or a lower fit. So this is great when adapting it to specifically fit you. So the last step to finish off this historical set of stays is to hand stitch down the bias tape along the neckline and the bottom edges of these stays. This is about the only hand stitching you will ever see me do is when I have to hand stitch down edging to a historical piece. Outside of that, I am not a huge fan of hand stitching because I just don't have the patience for it, but it always looks so nice on any historical undergarment, so I'll take it. Now that we have finished our historically accurate set of early 1800s Regency stays, we are going to repeat all of the steps that you just watched, except this time we are going to make it in a modern interpretation of these historical stays using yellow satin. So it's a little bit of a different kind of fabric, which way it a little bit trickier to work with. Um, and it's going to have kind of a different vibe and look along the end, but all in all, I basically used the exact same steps that I did in the first part, except I did decide to reinforce the back of my stays where my eyelets are going to be since satin fabric is a little bit more delicate than my tweed fabric I was originally using. So I will say that inserting the gussets in this second style using the satin was a lot more difficult. One, because satin is extra slippery, so trying to get these to stay in place was really hard. And satin has more of a tendency to fray, but after a lot of working and finessing, we finally got them to lay and fit how we wanted them.
So we sewed in all of the gussets and we also sewed in the binding. No, I'm saying we. I sewed in the binding. So I just have to hand stitch all of the bias tape to finish off the edges really nicely on the top and the bottom. And then we just have to add the eyelets and it will kind of be done. But I really am obsessed with this yellow. The satin's super fun and it's definitely a much more modern take on like a historical silhouette and undergarment, but being worn like on the outside. So there we have it gonna be super fun and then we got straps kind of like it you know sometimes making this squirting I feel like I'm doing like orthroscopic surgery where you have to like go in with this hook and find something and then pull it out and figure it all out I mean it really is like being a doctor sometimes sewing see there we did it So after my ties are inserted into my modern interpretation of these Regency stays, it will be time to reveal the finished pieces. Well, that is a wrap on this project. Thank you so much for letting me share my love of historical fashion, specifically the early 1800s Regency time period with you. I hope that you were inspired by what you saw. So if that was the case, make sure to give this video a thumbs up. And if you aren't a subscriber, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any new videos or projects in the future. See you in the next video.